Coming up, I try the Fuller Arita. I play some games. I have a chat to Jeff. And end with a typing. Let's get on then. Fuller Electronics produced some interesting peripherals in the early 80s, including their keyboard and the Fuller Sound Unit, or Soundbox. They also produced an updated sound unit named the Master Unit, which incorporated a speech chip. And they also produced a standalone speech synthesizer called the Fuller Arator. I will come on to how these two were merged later, but for now, in a familiar looking case, here is the Fuller Arator. Released in early 1983, Adverts started to appear around April, selling for a price of £39.95. The more popular speech unit, the Carrar Microspeech, sold for £29.95. The device was part of Fuller's small lineup, but had a very short lifespan due to Fuller going into liquidation around August 1984. The unit is housed, as I said before, in the familiar style box used for the sound unit and the master unit, and there's a reason for that. The circuit board was the same for all three devices, just with a few things left out. So the master unit had both a sound and speech chip. The sound unit had just the sound chip, and guess what, the Arator just had the speech chip. Here are the two boards next to each other, the Arator being the top one. The only difference I can see is that the Arator has a socket for the AY chip, and this additional chip on the right. The Arator also does not have a joystick port, but the circuit board does have a place for it. Does this mean then that if I swap the AY chip from the sound unit into the Arator, I'll get a master unit? Well, maybe we'll see later. The unit itself has a pass-through port, which works fine with the DivMMC. To allow it to work, you have to open it up and feed through your RF cable. The tape connections are redirected through the edge connector, and it fits nicely with the design of the rubber keyed models, and looks very good. Game support was surprisingly poor, with hardly any games making use of the speech. Spectrum Voice Chess from Arctic, Chucky Egg, Dimension Destructors, and Jungle Fever are the only ones. So let's start with the demonstration tape then. Hello, this is the Fuller Operator. These are a few examples of speech I can make. Make your Spectrum speak. The unit does have a built-in speaker, so the Spectrum sound is amplified through that. Loading the demonstration tape, and we get a few random samples of what the unit can produce. Interesting that it mentions Imagine Software. And Imagine advertised the fuller units in their inlays for some games, but none of them actually used it other than the joystick port. They did use the devices while working on Bandersnatch, but I've already covered that in a previous episode. To use the system in your own games is more difficult than using its closest competitor, the Carrar Microspeech. The Fuller uses OUT159 to control a set of allophones or sounds. Reading the manual, and I would have given up within a few minutes. It may be necessary to use one allophone or a particular phenome for word or syllable initial position and another for word or syllable final position. What the hell does that mean? The list of sounds looks very complicated, so let's give it a try then. As simple as it gets, the word hello. First we need H, that sounds like H from 27, I think. And then E, which is 51. And then double L, which is 45. And finally O, which should be 53. When running this on an emulator, I didn't have to do anything other than that. On a real machine, I had to put a pause in so that the speech would finish, and then end with 159,0 to shut the sound down. Anyway, that's what it sounds like. Nearly there. To get anything decent, you would need to test each sound for the word you want to make, which could take a long time, especially as sounds can be put together or duplicated. How do the games use this device then? Starting with Spectrum Voice Chess then, 
and this proved a bit of a problem. Loading all of the available TAP and TZX versions from the TOSEC archive did not cause the errator to work at all. Yes, there's speech, but this is from the program and not the hardware. I then tried my own copy, and this had a different loader, specifically for the errator, and when loaded, you get the errator voice. The game speaks both the computer moves and your moves. I then found the correct file on Spectrum Computing. Next, let's try Chucky Egg. You get a welcome message, and if you pick more than one player, each is introduced before the game starts, and then something that sounded like, be alert. Be alert. I purposely lost lives to hear the speech. This changes so it seems to be random. Sometimes it says go for it, sometimes I think don't stop, look out and have no fear, as well as tough one and if you die sometimes you get not good enough. Have no fear. At least it varies. How about dimension destructors then? A long speech, but as I've mentioned before you don't get any sound if you select fuller. Because there's no AY chip. It seems if you pick the fuller option at the start, you don't get any sound unless you have either or both of the sound unit, errator or master unit. And onto Jungle Fever then. Oh dear, do I have to play this again? You get some intro speech. And various other things throughout the game like Be Alert, You Fell, Missed and even Tough Luck from Chucky Egg, or was this game first? Who knows? Well, was that really worth nearly £40, considering only a few games were supported? So on to the big question then, can I make a master unit by adding the AY chip from the sound unit to the errator? Carefully extracting the AY chip and placing it in the errator unit, I plugged it all in and loaded the demo tape. And yes, we get AY sound. Loading Dimension Destructors, and yes, we get speech and AY sound. I have created a fuller master unit. Well, that was certainly, uh, expected. Or maybe not. How about recreating that old advert then, just for a bit of fun? Get a nice black background, position the games and the joystick. It's not the same joystick, I'll give you that. Get the lighting right and there you go. Looks okay to me. Mermaid Madness was released by Electric Dreams in 1986. The plot is a bit thin. You play Myrtle, a love-struck mermaid, chasing gormless Gordon, a diver. He jumps into the sea and vanishes. You dive in after him and set out to find him. Although he's not keen on this scenario and wants to hide. This is an arcade adventure in that you have to pick things up and use them at different locations. The RZX playback does not complete all of the puzzles in the game, 
so there are many things I had to find out myself, and that meant playing it for a long time. Set beneath the sea, most of the time, you swim about, constantly being pushed upwards due to buoyancy, and there are certain other things that make Myrtle float. Ahem. Anyway, because of the large graphics, the game quickly becomes frustrating. Getting past the Stingray early on is something almost impossible, because you keep getting stuck in the rocks. There are a few more frustrations too. The scenery gets in the way when moving from screen to screen, and this causes the game to flip between both screens very quickly, leaving you with nothing to do other than stab at the direction keys and hope you get free. The other thing is that you must do things in the right order, otherwise you can't complete the game. The first thing you need is some dynamite, and there are three sticks of it lying about, but you have to use them in the right order. Yes, you need dynamite number one first, followed by dynamite number three, and then dynamite number two. If you get the wrong one, it's game over, because all you can do is drop it, in which case it explodes, and you can't use it again. Also, if you're on the same screen, it kills you. Back to the game then, you should be able to find Gordon quite quickly. He's trapped under a sunken ship by an iron girder. You have to perform a series of tasks in the right order to set him free. First use Dynamite 1 to blast away some rocks to gain access to the other half of the game map. But before you do that, you need to position a lamp in one cave, otherwise you can't see where you're going. With the lamp in place and Dynamite 1 in your possession, you just blow up the rocks. You then have to go to the far right of the map to pick up Dynamite number 3. Keep an eye on your health though, the stout bottle top right will quickly go down and you only get one life. You can top it up by drinking more stout from various bottles scattered about. As I've said before, this soon becomes frustrating. The rest of the video I'll be using immunity and infinite life pokes, just to cover bits of the game, not in the RZX. Once you've got dynamite number 3 from the Egyptian part of the map, head back to under the start location on the far left. Drop Dynamite 3 on the rocks at the top of the screen, go to another screen and wait for the score to go up, which indicates the dynamite has blown up, and go back up and you can now get through the rocks. Next screen, and you can grab the salt. Now it's back to the Egyptian area. If we try to go down to the oyster at this point, the room seals and it's game over. So we need to grab another object first, Ank 2. So we need to drop the salt somewhere where we can find it, and then go up to the surface. Jump onto the island and grab Ank 2, and then go back down to the closed oyster. Place the Ank 2 anywhere in the room, this will stop it from sealing. Go back up, grab the salt, back down, and drop the salt on the oyster. The oyster will open, and a pearl will appear. So grab that, and head back up to the open oyster, guarding dynamite number 2. Drop the pearl, the oyster closes, but don't grab the dynamite yet. You need to go back to the surface, and grab a floating chest. Back towards Gordon, and there is a room with two sea monsters. Place the crate anywhere near them, and they will eventually vanish. Now we can go back up and grab Dynamite 2. At the bottom middle of the map, there's a room that needs some rocks blowing up to get access to it, so you can do that. You then need to move the lamp to a different position, and then you can enter the room and get the Arc Torch. This is needed to free Gordon. There's a beating heart that just indicates that you're getting closer to Gordon, and there's no real point to it really, it's only a small game map. You also have limited time before Gordon runs out of air. So you grab the torch, get back to Gordon, and drop it, and that's the game complete. Or is it? There's still some things that are a mystery. There are other objects to collect. There are two Anks, Ank 1 and Ank 2, and we've used Ank 2, but what does Ank 1 do? I've got no idea. I've taken it to various rooms, including the Egyptian area, dropped it in all the locations, and nothing seems to happen. There's also a tyre. This can be collected, and again, I haven't found a use for it yet. I wonder if there are more secrets in this game, which may explain the ending if you watch the RZX playback. The graphics, as you can see, are large and smooth, 
although getting stuck on scenery is a common thing. Sound is basic with a few effects, which is a pity really, and the control works okay, but the key layout is awkward and you can't change them. I use the joystick option, and the whole control system reminds me a bit of Cockatoni Wilf. There is a hacked version for 1 to 8K machines that has in game AY music, which works really well, and it's better than playing in almost silence. <laughs> Using the Immunity Poke and Infinite Time Poke, you can quite happily play away for a couple of hours trying to work out what each of the objects do, and then without any pokes, try to do it for real. I enjoyed this game, only because there were more things to do than the RZX showed, and there were very few objects and a small game map to try things out. Not a bad game, but the scenery bug is really annoying. Here's an update. I've just watched another walkthrough on YouTube and the tyre is used to stop the seahorse in the Egyptian section, otherwise it's almost impossible, in fact it is impossible, to get through to the dynamite without losing energy. It's tricky to drop it at the right time though. So this time, Jeff, we're going to talk about something that you've been pestering me to talk about for quite a while. Have I? And this is... Yes, you have. And this is hidden messages in loading screens. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Um, do you so... know any? <laughs> I have a site that tells me all about them. So I have a few favourites and we can discuss things like why, do you... why were they messages in screens? I mean, there are different reasons looking at the different messages you've got. Things like the name of the person that wrote it, and then you've got messages to other people. So, you know, do you want to pick some at random? Didn't a lot of them just have the name of the artist who did the screen? Yeah, and, and sort of strange messages. I mean, the first one is uh, Boot Camp Part 1, where there's a text on the loading screen that's hidden. says, what's going on, and then a date, and then drawn with tender care by, and then a name. Um, for, for those that are not familiar with this... The spectrum loading screen is drawn using paper and ink and if you set that to the same color you can't see what it is until the attributes are drawn on afterwards so some of the messages are hidden and you can see them by changing the ink color and then loading the screen separately or just get the screen and have a look don't you just do load screen string and then set the paper and ink to black and white and you can see them. you can if if the and file is part of the main you can if the screen isn't in the main part of the code or a headless thing or anything like that yeah okay fair some of the later ones were yeah i guess some of the later ones were you have things like agent x2 where you've got the mad professor's face and uh, rude words like poo fart and bum uh, hidden in <laughs> the loading screen <laughs> <laughs> Someone was having some fun that day. Elite, Anything can we like pick that? Elite? You mentioned Elite. Right. Elite, yes. I think that's probably the most famous or well-known one, where the loading screen of Elite shows a lovely sort of coat of arms with the word Elite on it. And if you actually strip away the attributes, you get the same thing, but with lots of damage and dirt all over it. That's quite cool, that one. It does look quite good, doesn't it? You mentioned you had a real favourite one, one that looks really yeah. good. Yeah, my favourite one is for Kronos, where the loading screen has a mysterious face and yellow eyes, and if you strip away the attributes, you get a smiley face and a message. The smiley face is the... terrific. It completely changes the screen. <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> Any other really good ones, Paul? Because you've looked at this more than I have. The other one that caught my eye was for a game called Silu, which has what looks like a circuit board on there, and uh, on a platform held up by pillars. And if you strip away the attributes and look at the bottom right, you'll see a man with a bottle of alcohol waving at you. That's quite cool, that one. It is. Nice it, I mean, it's different. Yeah. It is. You, we could probably spend... You could probably do an entire feature on this. And... Oh, Holland had quite a lot of information behind the loading screen. 
Heartland's got quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's not the one with the most amount of text in there, to be honest. There's one that's got a massive amount of text, like um, Hollywood Poker, for example. It has tons, doesn't a, it? Yeah. <laughs> a massive message on there. Look on all my other loading screens. So there must, it, this person must have done it on quite a few. Any other famous there's a lot. There's, there's a lot of text on Magic Johnson's basketball as well. Renegade 3, final chapter... Text says, we're sorry it's not as good as the other two. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> there is um, a hidden man on the pole position screen waving a flag. And also a sign that says Atari on the left-hand side, which for some reason were not you know, given colours, probably because somebody didn't like them. <laughs> one, of the, one of the screens in this list is called Sexy Blackjack. Really? Oh, I missed that one. It's not a lot on there apart from um, a message that says, do not copy. So somebody must have spent a long time looking at all the loading screens to see if there were any messages. I wonder if they went through every one because there's a lot of games in there. Mm. Uh, oh, Stormlord had some. Only a simple Dedicated message. Dedicated to Anna. Oh. Mm. Have you found the one that says, I'm not a fish? Oh, no. Nope. <laughs> I'm no fish. There's quite a few that says, I'm no fish. <laughs> <laughs> one <laughs> one Zatroth the Adventure has, oh, you stop messing about with this screen string, it's copyright, uh, but it's written vertically. Yes, I can say that. It's a I think we've done this to death, haven't we? And on that bombshell, we shall finish our little little roll through some interesting loading screens with secret messages. If you know of any more, please let us know and we can make sure that everybody else finds out about them. Manic Miner was, and still is, the most associated game with the Spectrum. Maybe Jet Set Willy gives it a run for its money, but for me, and many others, it's Manic Miner. The game was ported to numerous systems including the Dragon, Nintendo DS and Sam Coupe, and in some instances the game was extended with extra rooms. It was sad that us specy owners never got a chance to see or play these levels, despite the fact that they may not have been designed by Matthew Smith. In the case of the Sam version, the game had the initial 20 screens of the original, plus a further 20 rooms called the Deeper Caverns, and then another 20 rooms called Down Down Deeper and Down. Well, if you're a Manic Miner fan, then the Red Baron has come to your rescue, and ported all 40 of those extra rooms to the Specky. Now I don't claim to be a good Manic Miner player, but I can appreciate the effort, and know that some players will be eager to have a go on these new levels. The engine is pretty much the same, with a few minor tweaks. There's AY music now as well, but the game still maintains the challenge. If you're a Manic Miner fan, then go and grab this release. Rescue was published in Sinclair Programs in April 1984. This game was already available to download from Type Fantastic, and the listing has been slightly modified by Jim G, assuming that's Jim Grimwood, just to join the UDG definitions together. So let's take a look, and then think about how we can improve it. The game has two screens and you control a helicopter on a mission to rescue a man from the top of a hill. There are clouds to avoid, and also fuel pods to collect for extra points. The game draws empty spaces around the helicopter, and the clouds and fuel are always in the same place. Looking at the listing, this is done to detect if you crash into them. You move up and down, avoid the clouds, get to the man by passing over the top of him, and then it's on to the next screen. Here you just press one key to move downwards to land. A simple game that soon gets repetitive, as everything is always in the same place. The game also doesn't have lives, so you just keep on playing as long as you want. Improvements then. How can we make things better? Well, where do we start? Better landscape? Maybe a solid hill? Random cloud placements? 
an animated helicopter and man, better graphics for the helicopter and man and everything else. To do that, I'd need to change the entire collision checks to use the ATTR command. This means having different colors for fuel pods, clouds and man and the hill, which is fine. I could try and speed it up by moving the main loop to the top of the listing, but that's a step too far, I think. I could stop drawing spaces around the helicopter, possibly have a random hill, maybe a fuel limit as well, because there are fuel pods, but when you collect them, you just get more points. So I could look at implementing a limit of some kind, and a few other changes that may spring to mind as I'm working on it. There's a lot to go at. Let's start with the graphics then, and the hill. After a few different approaches, I opted for this. It draws random height hills with random edges. It only draws the right hand side of the hill, which is fine. That gives more room for the helicopter and clouds. The speed of drawing the hill is a problem, but I can't really speed it up anymore. The equal sign at the top just represents where the man will stand, and it will be changed later. Now on to the graphics themselves. The game has a few, and for some odd reason, they're not all concurrent. A to D are the four parts of the clouds, E had nothing, G and H were the explosions, I to L had nothing, and the helicopter itself was at M and N. I decided to rebuild these concurrently and also add a few more things, like a landing platform, some grass, and hopefully some animations. And here's the new set. I just need to add these to the game code and replace the parts in the code that use them. I decided to move away from using the bin commands and go with data statements. That's just a personal choice. Line 9000 onwards adds the new set. I also removed the sun drawing routine because it was rubbish. Set the border and colors up. Now I can add that hill drawing routine to the main game code, and then I can add some grass at the top. Now I can add the clouds. Line 150. I wanted random clouds, so I added that into the existing routine, being careful not to get them too close to the hill. And of course, random fuel pods. They go in at line 680. Let's have a look how it works then. Well, that's fine, apart from the collision, which of course there isn't any. It looks better, but the copter can still fly straight through that hill, as it did in the original. It will also not collide with anything now. Next is moving that copter without that awful flicker. The original uses the over command and redrew the copter every loop, as well as blank spaces around it. I removed the over command and just added blanks to cover the areas the copter had moved from. The old code to check collision was used on coordinates, which is why the clouds are in the same place each time. Removing these makes the game run much faster. And I added some animation to the helicopter as well. Let's see how that looks. Now we can draw a nice landscape, a hill, have some moving animated graphics, and a man. Next is the collision. The easiest way, I think, in BASIC is to use the ATTR command, and this will check the attribute value at any given character on the screen. So detect if your helicopter has hit the hill. I just need to check for the character in front of the copter. If it equals 44, which is the attribute value for cyan background and green ink, then POW, you've crashed. I detect this and then trigger the explosion, which I forgot to add the graphics for. Oops, I'll add those later. I then need to add the ATTR lines for the clouds, which is white on cyan, the fuel pods, which are going to be magenta on cyan, and finally the man, which is going to be blue on cyan. Now that runs fine. The code is all over the place, I'm just adding bits where I can find space. Now the second screen then, line 3000 onwards. Let's add some grass, and a wall, and a landing pad, and add a few lines of code to detect the position of the helicopter. The original just detected if you landed, but I'm going to add a check to make sure you land on the platform, and not just anywhere on the grass. And obviously I will also add some code, if you do land on the grass, you crash. And add a nice animation sequence at the end and back for a different level. Well, that's the game improved. But how about extending it? First, how about an intro screen, providing details, keys, which, by the way, I've changed to the standard Q&A. There's also no lives counter, so you can just keep playing. I add a lives variable and subtract from that each time you crash. 
then check for zero lives and jump to a game over message. Fuel then. Okay, we now need a fuel limit. I can add a variable and reduce that each time the helicopter moves. I can check if it reaches zero and then do something like crash the helicopter into the ground. Now I add the fuel collection routines with the fuel pods and add a fuel count to the screen. I wanted to make the landing screen a little bit better, so now it looks more like an airport. And for a bit of extra peril, I've added a random cloud, which also means I had to add the controls. The original only allowed you to move down, but obviously you need to move up if there's a cloud in the way. And I also added the collision detection. And finally, a nice font. And I've even added a sneaky surprise. If you get too much fuel, you get a fuel leak when you land, which reduces your fuel back to something a little bit more manageable and gives a bit more of a challenge. Well, that's the extended version. Not bad to play either. There is one strange problem in that sometimes the helicopter just explodes when it first gets drawn to screen. I've got no idea what's going on, but I'll leave that for now.